Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Now today, we are honored to be sitting down in person with Councillor Joe Horneck of the City of Mississauga, Ontario. But before we dive into our interview, a brief moment to acknowledge the support that keeps our show thriving. We want to acknowledge some of our new backers to the show. Michelle from Alberta, Lucas from Ontario, Yusuf from British Columbia. Thank you for helping us grow the show and bring more exciting content. If you want to join the growing list of supporters, visit crossborderinterviews.ca and pledge your support today for as little as $3 a month. Now, let's get to the show. So I want I want to jump into the very first question. I think it's the most important question that gets to the crux of who Joe is. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good question in that um, you need a sense of duty, I think, to enter government on the right mindset and the right footing. Um, you know, I mean, I guess if you go to the, my core, I've always been a per people person. And, uh, you know, my career has been background in finance and capital markets uh, where I kind of didn't get a lot of people stuff. I mean, I had a lot of staff. That was the part I enjoyed in the job. But I also served on a few different community boards. Uh, in particular, the one that really triggered me was uh, a women's shelter, Arma House. Um, and, you know, you could really see the difference when I was acting as the treasurer there, that a small amount of money, which could often come from government through a grant or something, could really make in the difference of people who are very vulnerable, right? Uh, women and children fleeing domestic violence is pretty much the definition of people who are vulnerable. And, um, you know, if we got a little extra money, then kids got to go to Wonderland or they didn't. And so um, I think, you know, a sense of duty is important in government because it drives you to want to keep doing this and you know it helps you get over the rough spots right i think one of the things i'd say recently that kind of hit me is uh i have a traffic calming project and um you know when i was in the election last year i went through this neighborhood and everyone said their top priority was traffic calming and so now it's actually in front of people and literally the shovels are in the ground and now i'm hearing the kind of negative feedback well, why are we changing it? It's been that way since the 1960s. I've lived here since 19, yada, the yada. The Nimbyism. That's right. And so I think, you know, if you don't have a sense of purpose and a, and a drive of why you're going to be there, you know, um, the criticism hit me a little bit just on a personal level. And, you know, I'm a new politician, so maybe that's what I'm just going to have to get used to. But if I didn't have that sense of purpose, you know, it would be harder to kind of get past those. So I think it's important to have that. So what was the decision based on getting into municipal politics? Because social services, uh, shelters, is traditionally a provincial mandated uh, uh, program. But you decided last election in 2022 to throw your hat in the ring for the municipal realm. So what was it for you that said, A, 2022 is the year I need to get involved, and B, municipal is where I think I'd make the biggest impact? Yeah, so I mean, um, I also ran four years earlier and just narrowly missed um, to the same incumbent. Uh, I missed by 347 votes, which okay. is a very small number, 2%. <laughs> I like how you know the exact number. Oh, <laughs> and you sweat every single one of those. Um, but no, I mean, I think the attraction of municipal is, A, you, you don't have the party politics. That divisiveness that, especially in the last several years, has really become hard to stomach. Um, because, you know, inherently, I I'm a person of the center. And, you know, I'm a fiscal conservative, but a social liberal. And so I don't always fit neatly into a party. Uh, I definitely steer towards one party more, but I don't fit that. And I think municipal, the best thing about it is it's tangible. It's tangible things and a counselor can have direct impact themselves. So, you know, if somebody came up to me and said, Joe, go solve national defense. Oh, great. Can I have uh, a quarter billion dollars in about 10 years? I'll get right on that. Um, you know, the, in municipal affairs, you can say, Joe, I need a stop sign. Something's really dangerous here. I can do that. I will order a traffic study. If the traffic study comes back and says, yeah, there's some reason to put, let's do it. We put the stop, stop sign. So, I mean, I think the tangibility of municipal politics and the fact that you can have that more direct impact without going 50 rounds in a caucus, worrying if the leader of your party agrees or doesn't agree with that. Um, I think that's really appealing and you can see the you can actually see the changes because it is tangible. It's in your community. 
I, I often quote Scott Pierce, president of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Uh, he was just elected here in Toronto. Um, municipal governments are the government of proximity. You are the closest to the people and you make the biggest difference. But there is an apathy around municipal politics because there isn't that partisanship. There isn't that the right versus the left, the center versus the right center or whatever. In your time, and I know it's only been a short period of time, have you learned something about the municipal experience that before you got elected, you were going, hmm, maybe this is going to be a little bit different. Maybe it's going to work at the speed of light. And if I want to get that stop sign put up, it's going to happen tomorrow. Or is it something else that people often come to you and say, why can't you fix this? Well, because we have to go still through the procedures, the bylaws, the policies, it has to go in front of council. It's not just me going to the operator and say, clear this person's street. What's been the biggest learning experience in this short period of time that you've been an elected official? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the start of your question started having me thinking about kind of who participates in municipal politics. Yep. Which we're going to talk about later, but yeah. uh, let's do it now so, if you want. So we can do it. Let's just do it now. Just kind of triggered me when you asked the question in a particular way. Um, and I mean, I think the thing I really noticed is that, you know, I'm 45, I have three kids. If I wasn't me um most people like me don't participate in municipal politics even though i would be some of the people most likely to use the services yep right i would be the one having the kids at the soccer camp and the baseball fields and all the other things that you would draw on uh, i would be using the municipal trails i would go to the library all those things and yet i would be so busy in my life and my career i would almost not at all vote um the people who do vote are mostly retired um, and, um, you know, not a, not everybody, but there is a uh, somewhat of a disposition to keep things static. Why do you think there is an apathy? Especially when it comes to municipal, because uh, in across Canada, and this, uh, I know <clears throat> Mississauga is a unique beast because it's a city. It's a large city. It's in the greater Toronto area. And you, you, I don't think there was any acclamations in the last election. No. no. But in a lot of municipalities, and I know I'm putting you on the spot here, That's okay. you're seeing a lot more people just turn away from municipal politics. Like yeah. 20 years ago, you'd see about 15 people run for one position. Yes. Where now you're seeing about four or five. Is there an apathy in Mississauga, not only when when it comes to the city hall but when it comes to people engaging with you like when you go out and ask people for their opinions are they willing to give you their opinions i think they are but you have to go out and get them okay right? and so, how do you do that because there's so, always different ways so i i you know we're in the summer months now and i i actually still do go knock doors good for um, you so uh, I'm trying to go twice a week uh, as much as I can to still meet people. And I'm going back to the neighborhoods I wasn't able to engage with well enough during the campaign because I have a very large ward. Uh, it's almost 80,000 people. <laughs> and and you know, it is. And, and I mean, the challenge of my particular ward is there's very little density. So it's, all, it's almost all single detached houses, which is a heck of a lot of walking to get to 22,500 residences. Um, so anyways, I'm going back to those things and I, I'm knocking again. And, you know, when I get people at the door, yeah, there is some apathy, but there is some engagement when I start saying, you know, hi, I'm your counselor. Uh, you know, what should I be doing better in your neighborhood or your city? And, uh, you know, you'll get some blank stares. But when I say uh, roads, garbage, libraries, parks, do you crime, get the opposite then as people well? trigger on something usually. Do you get the opposite where people might think, okay, you're a counselor, so you, you're going to be able to solve provincial or federal issues? I know you talked about, you jokingly said national defense, but when I talk to municipal counselors from across Canada, the biggest thing they're hearing right now is jurisdictional issues. Yeah. Whether it be, okay, we have healthcare issues and it's massive after COVID 19, we have education issues. And the municipal counselors are dealing with those issues more than they were 10, 15 years ago. Are you hearing? more provincial jurisdictions or are you seeing more people actually understanding the <clears throat> levels of jurisdictions that different levels have uh you know i mean you get some i, I wouldn't certainly say it's anywhere near the majority i think okay. many people know at least roughly where you are um good, i think i think for the, mississauga <laughs> yeah, well, you know um you know I, I i'd say the biggest thing i'm finding lately is when people are raising issues that you know we've had some revisions to our, you know what city council can do yeah especially around development um you know i'll have people who have lived in a, a neighborhood for you know 30 40 years etc cetera, etc cetera. i was the original owner uh but there's a basement apartment being built across the street that's illegal i'll be like that hasn't been illegal for a really long time um 
but people's mental maps, especially in my neighborhoods, because they're there's they're quiet neighborhoods. They're supposed to be sleepy neighborhoods. Uh, that's why people bought into them. Um, just you know, the things that are now coming forward from the province to be more assertive on housing and that the city is buying into. Like we're not unwilling partners in this mix. Um, people's mental maps are, well, development happens over there. It happens in downtown. It wouldn't possibly happen in my quiet neighborhood. My neighborhood's been the same for 40 years. So I think that's a place where I get interjurisdictional challenges, right? Where even if I said, I really think that basement apartment is the worst idea I've ever heard in my life, I couldn't do something about it, even if I wanted to. Um, you know, and I think I try not to throw the other level of government under the bus because I don't think that's fair. And also, I think we need to have a wider conversation about, you know, what is this city going to be about? We need to take on another 120,000 housing units. And people are used to that happening just in very specific areas of the city. They're not ready for it to come to the quiet, you know, four, store, four bedroom communities. Uh, but that's what's going to happen. And that's what happens in other major cities over time, right? You know, uh, and I think we need people to be changing their mental maps. And that's going to be a real struggle for the heart and soul of the city. How do you see yourself playing a role in changing that narrative and helping that move forward? Because you're one vote. You're not whipped a caucus. So nope. you have to get the majority of your councils on board to help move the city forward. How do you see your role as councillor and how do you see your uh, role as a local representative in ensuring that the city doesn't become stagnant, but the pockets do happen and the people who are upset might who might not want to see the change come around to understanding that change is good for communities because taxes will go up if you don't change and you don't grow. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think on an, in, on, I guess there's two kinds of ways of communicating. One on an individual basis, right? So, I mean, I think if someone's upset about a particular thing, you know, you can talk more about the housing crisis and say, like, look at how would your grandchild or, you know, the local kid down the street ever afford something if we don't build more, mm -hmm. right? So you can argue them the supply issue, right? Um, that only gets you so far because usually people will still be like, <laughs> yeah, but do it over there. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I think, and then on a broader sense, like we need to be communicating as a city that this is a changing city. And I think when we talk about housing, that bleeds into so many other things. It goes into traffic control and speeding. It goes into uh, parking on the street. If all of a sudden we have more duplexes, more basement apartments, all of a sudden garbage and parking become more issues when they were never traditionally issues in that particular neighborhood. That's fine. We can deal with it, but we have to be thinking about that ahead of time. We have to be educating people about that ahead of time. And then I think, you know, it hits us in just so many different ways, like building, parking, uh, garbage, you know, municipal taxes, all these kinds of ways it just comes back or, or busing service. Like the history of busing in the city was mostly like, well, we provide a busing service. It usually only fits the lowest income brackets. Because anyone who has any money drives a car in Mississauga, don't you know? Well, um, the, the that's not traffic, the case anymore, yes, right? Yeah. <laughs> but it, and then you know, so you, if if I have said to somebody, you know, I want to put more money into transit, you know, like it's a needed thing. We're, we're densifying the city in a way we've never had before. We can't have everybody driving a car. The traffic situation won't work. And now, when we're authorizing new developments, we're looking at having less than one parking spot per unit because that's the way we have to go. Um, and so, you know, we need our transit system to be not just good, but great. And I think right now there's a real challenge in transit to do that. We need to fund it a little bit better. And um, our ridership now is 114% of what it was before COVID. So we've grown 14% despite COVID. Uh, wow. And we will have an ask coming to council in the, in the fall of our new budget um, because we haven't yet added a dollar beyond what we were paying in 2019. And so that's gonna to have to change. You can't have 14% increased ridership. And by the fall, it'll be more than that, right? Because every month it grows that little extra bit. So we're gonna to need to fund that better. And, and you know, I don't know, some people may be upset by that, I don't know. Now you're, you're elected at a local level, a local ward level, so, but you know and I know that you can't just look at your ward as a general consensus. You have to look at the 
bigger picture. You are there to represent all of city count, city of Mississauga. Yeah. And I'm going to quote Spock here for a second. And if you've listened to the show, you know it's my favorite quote. How do you balance the needs of the many with the needs of the few? Because you can't. You have to look at the bigger picture, but you can't forget about the people who are struggling the most, or even who are having the biggest issues, whether it be cost of living, inflation, whether it be not being able to afford even getting on the bus to go somewhere. So you have to make it reasonably inexpensive, but still understand that costs do need to happen. So how do you see your role as counselor in balancing the city as a whole with the individual person? I mean, that's a really tough one. And I mean, honestly, you kind of have to go issue by issue on that, right? Um, because you could say something and then another issue will come around and you'll be like, oh, that doesn't feel like the right answer for that one. I mean, I guess, you know, you could look is at- Is that challenging though? Looking at issues issue by issue or is it simpler because then you can actually dissect the actual issue instead of just looking at it as a Mississauga issue, but a transit issue or a, yeah. a park issue? I, I think, I mean, I think some things like a transit issue is a, is is broadly seen by councillors to be a citywide issue. Okay. So just because that particular road happens to go through my neighborhood, I, I would feel just fine if a councillor had an opinion about that route. I mean, generally, we don't get into that level of detail. We let the staff handle that as the experts that they are. <laughs> um, but, you know, I guess a, a good example maybe of where you're right, is we had um, a project on Bloor Street and we were going to revamp the road. We were going to add some bike lanes. We were going to, ultimately, we decided to um, drop one lane of traffic, which was the controversial part. So it crossed two councillors' borders, uh, Councillor Fonseca, Councillor Kovac, uh, wards three and four. Um, and Councillor Fonseca and, and Kovac uh, agreed on the bike lanes that they were needed. Um, they disagreed on should we drop one lane of traffic uh, in order to have a road diet. And um, ultimately, councilor, council as a whole voted to support having a road diet and dropping one lane because uh, staff said, as an example, we expect a lot of the pass through traffic would take alternative routes that are better suited. Higher order roads would then take on that traffic because people would decide you know, that's not the best place to go. The neighborhood, uh, well, I should say the vocal neighborhood, because <laughs> there's a very strong difference, I think, between the vocal neighborhood and the quiet part of the neighborhood. The vocal neighborhood, many petitions, many, many deputations to council, often very um, heartfelt and honest and sometimes fear mongering. And it really depended on the person and what was being said. Um, it really saw the whole gambit of feedback. And so I think that was a challenge, I guess, where I'm getting in a long, long-winded way, was, you know, the councillors who are not from those areas. We had two councillors with two different points of view. We had to decide what was best in our minds for the city. And in that case, you know, we went with what the staff recommendation was, uh, which was to do the road diet. And... Uh, I supported that decision. Um, but there's respect around yeah. the council table because while you may have two different opposing views on council, at the end of the day, you have to understand that you're all in it for s the city, right? Agreed. And sometimes your side doesn't win and sometimes your side does win and you just move on. It's not like you're a liberal and I'm never going to vote for the way you are. You're looking at it as yeah. what's best for the city, right? Agreed. Yeah, and I mean, I think like one of the things I can say uh, in this term of council um, since I've been elected, I don't feel like we're divided into factions. I don't feel like there's You're a, one. Yeah, like man. a Jets and Sharks. Like, we definitely disagree, <laughs> and some people feel more one way than another on particular issues and, and do cluster on individual issues. But then on other issues, they're completely opposite, right? So there's no, um, you know, lockstep group of people voting one way over the other, which I've seen happen in other cities. Um, so I think that's a very positive thing for the city. Uh, that we can each kind of not personalize it and, and, like you say, like do the best we can for the city. Well, you don't want to personalize it, I do. I want to go to, to you as a counselor, your role as a counselor. Now, you're a relatively young man. I'm assuming you have a young family. You said you have uh, children and a wife. Um, the life of a counselor is full time. And I know this, that it doesn't mean just nine to five full time. It's you go to the grocery store, you're a counselor. You go to an event, you're a counselor. I know you're relatively new in the, your first term, but I can imagine that being a wake up call that when you go out, you're not just Joe, you're counselor wherever you go. Yeah. And you have to 
be willing to answer questions and take questions from the general public no matter where you are. Has that been challenging for you, the personal and private life of a counselor? Um, I'm okay with it. Like, I, I like to. Is your family okay with it? Well, that's where I was going to go after that, right? Is, um, you know, as an example, like, you know, uh, I have a, two, a two year old, a seven year old, and a 12 year old. So, okay. 10 years spread between them. We, we'll take the two year old on walks around the block in a stroller still. And, you know, um, where it kind of struck me is the kind of like minor celebrity or local person <laughs> who gets recognized. Um, you know, just a woman walking her dog is like, hey, Joe, and then wanted to engage me about, um, you know, the possibility of our mayor uh, leaving the city for another position as Ontario leader of the Liberals uh, and wanted to talk about that. And I'm just like, well, you know, out for the family with the literally a stroller walk. And OK, yeah, we can engage with this. Um, I think the place where it's hit me maybe in a, in, a, in a place that makes me slightly worried is how it does affect the kids. Um, like, do they know that dad's a counselor? And oh, for sure. No, and, and I, I, I like taking them to events, and, and uh, my daughter loves to come to events. <laughs> um, she's really had a great couple times at different festivals, especially. Um, she loves the Vietnamese community. She's grabbed that, and um, she came to an event, and then uh, my wife and her went to the library, and she took a, a book out about Vietnam. And I'm like, well, that's wonderful. Like, I love that she engaged with it. She loved the the costumes and the, all the things that happened at this particular event. And then, you know, it expanded her interest in something. I thought that was wonderful. The downside is I also know that um, there was one point where um, a younger girl was engaging with her uh, in a negative way. And um, she said something about me being a counselor. And, and I didn't quite get the gist of what she had said. Um, but I wasn't sure if she maybe used that as a shield to stop some hostile activity at her. Okay. And I never really got the story on that one. Okay. But just to say that it, you know, it comes back in different ways. Um, you know, a lot of them being positive. Like, uh, I've been really, uh, happy with how, for instance, my, my kid's school engages with me, um, to help find ways to help out things in that particular area. Uh, and other schools have too, but, um, you know, I think just because it was easy access of me walking down the hallways, dropping the kids off that the principal happened to mention a couple things. Okay. Um, so that's nice. Uh, so yeah, there's a bit of pro and con though. There's a little apprehension on we, how the kids will take it. I think we see a lot of a rise in social media being a negative tool to attack municipal councillors, in particularly across Canada. Um, I know you're again your first term here, but have you seen the negative side of social media, and how do you make sure that you check it and not make sure that you're not going down the rabbit hole and responding to every single negative comments because i have yeah. not looked i'm assuming you get yeah. them but i'm assuming there's a re respectful way to respond to them and then there's a non-respectful way to just ignore them yeah i mean so i think um on the negative side um myself and the other counselors continue to get tagged by uh people in the anti-vax movement yeah Frankly, it's gonna I, be there forever. I, I ignore them. Okay. I, I take myself off of whatever they've added me, um, and you move on with life. And it, they tag pretty much every day. <laughs> there, there's something. Um, the other side, I guess, where people interacted with me in a respectful way, but it was criticism was around. I mentioned the traffic circle uh, issue. Uh, people who were not happy with the situation. Um, very much were active on social media saying they didn't like it, but no one took it in an unprofessional way. And so um, I probably learned from that though, that if I am too, too active in responding, that I probably feed it more. Um, I feel like I need to be responding in some ways, but I also know that if I'm on responding to each and every single comment, that that's probably not a good t use of your time. Well, no, not, well, you know, I mean, yes and no, but, <laughs> um, it's also, it's probably not good for my mental state. I just say, right. If, um, you feel attacked, you, I didn't sleep well that night because I, especially that one hit me because I said, like, I did not do the door knocking. I did do the work and I felt like I was on the right side of the issue with the majority of the people. Um, but those majority of the people, some of them stepped up and did say positive things. Um, but I think it's one of those things, like one of those things I've really kind of thought about lately is how do you conduct a public meeting? And, um, you know, one person said to me recently that you shouldn't allow neither clapping nor booing. Because just because they agree with your point of view, 
you shouldn't be saying, oh, I, you know, thank you, citizen, for coming forward and saying that. Because if somebody does have the opposite view, you've now loaded them to feel more hesitant to come forward. And so I guess I've been reflecting since I've heard that, that that's probably a better way. And it makes you think about how you conduct your public meetings. Like on that traffic circle, we, ha we didn't have a, I stand in front of the room and take questions point of view. We had uh, boards where people could come around and ask questions individually. And I stood there and people kind of directed stuff at me and directed things to staff. And I think that was probably a healthier approach because if it had just been me standing at the front of the room, the loudest person who disagreed with it the most could be the first comment. And then everyone after that gets sheepish, right? Yeah. And, and certainly we've seen that like on the Blur Street thing I referenced earlier. We saw it when we talked about cannabis in the city and the vote on cannabis. Um, you know, you really feel that people who are in the positive just stop participating. Um, and just even going back to the Blur Street one, you know, during the last campaign in November, the incumbent councillor Fonseca, her main rival, used that as their number one plank. Stop Blur Street, don't have any change there. The incumbent councillor won by 70%. I think it was slightly over 70%. Yeah. Like, she won a mandate, but that person keeps coming back saying they represent the neighbourhood. But, but hold on a minute. That neighborhood voted overwhelmingly for this councillor. So do you represent the neighborhood? Yeah. Do you? Or do you represent a small number of people who have very loud voices? So I want to turn to the second big subject that we're going to talk about here. And it's going to be a quick one because I'm cautious of time here. And before I ask this question, I'm going to preface it by saying this is a, question, this is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a direction of council. This is not a motion of council. This is not policy movement at council. This is just your opinion. Joe, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing the city of Mississauga today as of recording this interview? Uh, I think it's the development and all the fallout that will come from that, right? So uh, the city has uh, agreed with the province that we need to build 120,000 homes or units, I should say. Uh, in the city and but there's nowhere to go though right well because, only building up yeah, and that's what and, I meant yeah. and yeah and so that's it like right now uh, a couple blocks from here we're gonna have an 80 story building it'll be the largest building outside of Toronto in the country wow. you know and people would not think that that's gonna happen in Mississauga um, you know it's regular that we're having 50 you know 40 50 60 story buildings come before us for approval and it's going to change the face of the city. We need to, the biggest thing ch and challenge us is going back to what I'm thinking about, the heart and soul of the city. Are we a suburb? And I would argue we are not. We haven't been a suburb for a while, but there's a lot of people who still think of us as a suburb. And so if we continue to think of ourselves as a suburb and not a standalone city, then we're going to fight on transit. We're going to fight on each development application. Um, that's the biggest challenge. How do we do that? I mean, that 120,000 was what we were supposed to have built over, I think it was 30 years, <laughs> not 10. And so how do we do that? Like our water infrastructure, our sewage infrastructure, our road infrastructure, where we're putting the local community centers and the fire stations. And we're taking that 30 year plan and condensing it to 10 years. And then we have the development charge issue that the province has taken away from us. So what tools are we doing to build those community services that make these good neighborhoods that people actually want to live in. You can build a tower in the sky, but it can be just hell on wheels. Why? No, there's no library here. There's no community center here. There's no community pool. There's no park. There's no green space. Well, why would anyone want to live there? So what are we going to build, right? And especially in Mississauga, because we did start as a suburb, you know, in a lot of cases, we don't have a thing you would associate with, for instance, a downtown. So a lot of our density is coming to this downtown. And yet, you know, is there a sports stadium? No, there is not. Is there a central park? No, there is not. Um, you know, a lot of the things, the farmer's market, you can kind of go through a list of things you'd see in places like Windsor or London or Kitchener or Hamilton. And we don't have a lot of those things because the way we grew up. Um, and so we have to think about that too. We do have some wonderful things like Celebration Square and the Central Library, uh, but we also lack things in some of our places we're putting density. That comes with money though. Money. And money is a big thing. And, money is a big thing. And uh, the federal government, provincial government doesn't seem to be wanting to throw money at municipalities right now. They want them to build. And there's a lot of downloading going on. That's just my opinion for those who are watching or listening. To this. I think that's a pretty well held <laughs> opinion, to be honest, <laughs> um, especially in municipal circles. Exactly. Um, how do you do it? How do you hope for the best that you can build 125,000 units for people to come move? 
build the infrastructure and not raise taxes 10 13 percent each year until you do it because even with the, just the new infrastructure growth that's a uh, pretty penny and then you include the okay what if this pipeline what, what if this water main breaks what if this road collapses yeah. the ma asset management program that you probably have has things that are coming up for needing repair so how do you see yourself as counselor and council as a whole navigating the tricky terrain that we currently live in because things are not getting cheaper and if you wait 10 no. years they're going to be more expensive than they are right now yeah and i mean i think we also have like big infrastructure projects on transit too so um you know we have the lrt coming it should hopefully go online in a couple of years um but you know they cut a loop out of it and that loop would service that 80 story building and a heck of a lot of other buildings all around it right so um we just authorized a new thing for five new buildings where the YMCA used to be. The YMCA has a pool and all those facilities the YMCA has. It's going away. Yeah. There's no other community center going to replace it. Uh, and yet we're putting in, I think it was 3,300 units on that space. Like 3,300 <laughs> units on one space. It's, I don't know, a few acres. And wow. it's all going to be up, right? It's uh, 30 to 50 stories, I think it was on that project. So, you know, how do we pay for all that? I mean, honestly, you feel like you're begging every day of the week. <laughs> um, you know, look, the province said they'll quote unquote make us whole. And that was December last year. And yet we're in August. We don't know what that means yet. How has eight months gone by? Almost nine. We have no idea what making us whole in terms of getting rid of the development fees means. There's got to be a point where they got to tell us this. I mean, the city of Mississauga, the region of Peel, Brampton and Caledon, Toronto and Newmarket, I think it was, yeah. is an oddball, are all undergoing these audits. Our staff is insanely confident that we have been managing our books the right way, that when we say that we have an infrastructure deficit, it honestly is an infrastructure deficit. It's not some made up number. Uh, that when we say we have reserve funds, they're reserve funds with a purpose. They're not a slush fund. They're saying we're accumulating reserves in order to pay for that bridge that needs to get rebuilt in a couple of years or that road or that library, et cetera. They're dedicated. And there's a difference between dedicated reserves being built up so that you don't pay everything all at once and have your tax rates spiking and plummeting. That's the point of a reserve fund yeah. and a slush fund, right? That's not what we have. So I think when we go through this audit, honestly, I don't know what the province is going to do if the other side of that audit, they come out and go, uh, yeah, everything they were just saying is right, and you've yanked out this money from them, make them whole. <laughs> right? Good luck. That's all and, I can and, say. And, and, you know, from all I hear, as much as uh, the province likes slush funds and, and side funds, uh, you know, that they're running a surplus. And, you know, they're putting them into reserves. I want to turn to my last subject here because I'm cautious of time, and yep. it's tourism. I love tourism. I'm in your community. After what you're about to say, I'm going to go visit these spots. So be be cautious about that. Okay. Where are some of the hidden gems in Mississauga that tourists from across Canada should visit? Because we we know when you come to Toronto, you go to like CN Tower and all that. But I'm I'm the off the beaten path guy. I want to go to the places where people might not know and explore okay. so what are some of the hidden gems in mississauga that you would recommend to people coming here so I'll, I'll give you two uh one is a natural one riverwood conservancy which is in my area um it is a beautiful park with wonderful gardens uh beautiful i was just there dropping my daughter off for an art camp and um there's a uh, living arts mississauga is based out of there and um it's beautiful it's an old house and gardens and then it feeds onto the river trails which go for kilometers and kilometers and kilometers down the middle of mississauga that is our absolute gem of the city um and i'm really happy that it's in my ward um but you know it's, it's a city-wide gem it's not just mine because it is really an asset for the city so that'd be one I absolutely go for a walk i know it made several uh leaf peeping lists last year okay and at one point uh i kind of was kind of failing to understand why are there so many cars <laughs> going into this place because usually it's it's busy ish but not busy um so anyways uh that's also going to be super important because of that density i was talking about earlier that is going to be some of the closest green space to many of those people so we really need to do a good job on that um the second place i'd give you would be if you want to go for lunch you either go to streetsville or port credit Okay. Um, you know, both have lots of great restaurants. 
it's kind of gets a little bit of the small town feel because everything's about two stories tall and that's a beautiful kind of two little neighborhoods they're part of the old mississauga towns that were amalgamated with mississauga and so they actually have that uh small town feel sort of thing uh in those couple of blocks that govern it so that would be the place to go get lunch or have a beer or something like that what do you where do you go after a hard day after a stressful day at council after a long day of meetings after a long day of community events is there a place in town that you go and yes i know you're about to say your own house so you can relax but i'm gonna challenge you and say after your house where do you go in town (laughs) well i was gonna actually say sports fields for my my kids sports (laughs) Uh, either baseball or soccer this summer um, and hockey in the winter or dance You're, you're breaking the mold on me here, man. Everyone says their house and you're saying something completely uh, different. Well, I mean, I do love my house and sitting in my backyard um, on my little deck. But you'd, de- my you'd be at a sports field? Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of times I'm at sports fields and, I, and that's the one balance going back to the whole family life thing. I try to balance, you know, a limited number of engagements in the evenings yep. and put as much as I can into the daytime so that I can be a dad. Um, you know what? I was recently talking to a, a fellow who was a counselor for oh twenty something years, uh, quite a while ago, and he said, "You know, um, don't make the mistake I did. Uh, I wasn't a good dad. I got consumed by the job, and I didn't take as much time as I wished for my kids. Don't do it the way I did it." And that really hit home, because this is a guy who has now been out of politics for twenty uh, five ish years, and. Um, he did the job for 25 years. And that wow. was his feedback to me as the new guy. Um, and that just came out of the blue. We were talking about something completely different. We were talking about the River Valley, actually. Okay. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's a cautionary tale to make sure that you do that. I would also say that's the benefit of municipal politics versus the other levels, right? You can come home to your own bed at night. As busy as a day you have, you I can still tuck the kids in a lot of nights. Because you're not in Ottawa, you're not in downtown Toronto. Yeah. And, and bless those people for doing it, um, but I don't have any interest in doing it while my kids are this age. You know, I want to be a dad. So my last question for you, counselor, and this is the most important question I think I've asked any counselor or mayor, and it's, what makes the city of Mississauga such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Yeah, I think, and honestly, I think, you know, you have uh, the great cities of the world. you got your Londons, your Paris. I'm never going to have an Eiffel Tower. Yeah. But I, the thing I aspire to for Mississauga, and I think at its very core, what Hazel McCallion and Bonnie Crombie have built is a great place to raise your family. We have fantastic parks, amazing rec centers, great programming, uh, you know, Living Arts Center, Celebration Square. You know, when we have Canada Day, we have five different fireworks displays in different parts of the city. Like, that's really rare, right? Partly because we're so gigantic. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you know, we really know how to put it on it. In each of the neighborhoods, be it Malton, Streetsville, Port Credit, Clarkson, Clark, you know, uh, and in these places all have something to offer. Um, but I think at its core, Mississauga has been a great place to raise a city. And that's what I want to make sure we're doing. When we talk about all this density, when we talk about this, I don't want to just build a tower in the sky for the sake of making a number. I want to build a good community. And I feel like my fellow counselors feel the same way too, right? Sometimes you look at a project and you're like, something's going to get built there. I 100% agree with it. It needs to get built there. But it needs to change like this or like that to make it a good community. And that's, in a lot of cases, when Mississauga gets criticized about not building enough things fast enough, that's what we're doing, is we're trying to sculpt and round the edges to make some place that people actually want to live. And, and not just live on the day they bought it, right? You build something, you run away, you never see it again. I want some place that people will say 20 years from now, boy, am I glad I, I moved into that neighborhood. So you, you, you just posed a question that I thought, I've never thought of, but I want to know from you right here, right now, and this is the last question. What does community mean to you? I mean, community should be a place where you can connect with people. It should be a place where you feel comfortable and safe. It should be a place where you can raise your family. And by that, I mean, you know, you have access to sports. You have access to good schools. Um, you know, that you you can get out and interact with people and have interesting things in an interesting life, right? That you have different community events that are happening, cultural festivals, food festivals, yeah. whatever it is. Like, that's another great thing about living in a city like Mississauga. We have so many different communities Uh, ethnic communities, religious communities, who go out and show us their wonderful things, right? Uh, I mentioned earlier about the Vietnamese community. It's a great example, 
right? Uh, we have uh, Saigon Park here in the city, which is a fantastic park we just built a couple years ago around a water reservoir uh, to control our stormwater. And so we took that and we built a really great park out of it. And, you know, that's just one example of one community. And there's so many in Mississauga that add to our rich diversity. And I think that's wonderful. And I'm glad that my kids get to grow up in a place that has that kind of interesting life, right? People from around the world. Counselor, thank you so much for this. This has been an honor and a pleasure to sit down with you for the last 45 minutes and talk about Mississauga and yourself. It's uh, always fascinating to hear from people about what they're doing in their own communities because, as I said in our pre-interview, it's hard, it's high time that municipal councillors start getting the credit for helping our communities thrive. So thank you. Well, I think people talk about London and Paris and Rome, but the best place in the entire world is Mississauga, Ontario. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Cross-Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires both dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes below or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, no matter how big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, stay talking.